Welcome to the Psych Health and Safety in Canada podcast. And today as my guest is my friend Jordan Friesen, who is also the president of Mindset Mental Health Strategy. And Jordan has been playing around in the psych health and safety field for a while. And it's a uh, uh, one of those long and winding road stories, because I know, Jordan, you started off as an occupational therapist. So how did a nice guy like you get into uh, a place like this? Uh, playing around in psych health and safety. That, that sounds like I'm having a ton of fun. Uh, and some days, in fact, I am. Uh, some days I'm stuck behind a desk uh, doing podcasts and webinars with Marianne Baden. <laughs> Uh, but uh, thanks so much for having me, Marianne. It's really a pleasure to be here chatting with you. Uh, I guess uh, you you started out by by telling people I'm an occupational therapist, uh, which is of course true by trade. Uh, I'm a registered occupational therapist. Uh, I've been an OT now for just about a decade, which makes me feel uh, aged, uh, I suppose. But uh, my journey towards working in psychological health and safety was a bit of right place, right time, uh, a bit of professional interest, and perhaps a bit of uh, a bit of philosophical motivation and waning that that got me here. Uh, I practiced clinically for a number of years in rural Manitoba, and uh, primarily my OT practice was focused on working with young men recovering from psychotic disorders, and I learned a ton. Uh, doing that work and learned a lot about myself, learned a lot, uh, in particular about the the mental health care system that that was really supposed to be supporting the clients that I was working with. And and for those of you listening and for you yourself, Marianne, and you probably know quite well that the mental health care system is not really a system. It's more a conglomeration of disjointed parts. And and so what came out of that, I think, was a real desire to try to make an impact at a slightly larger scale uh, and to try to affect some change at, at a systems level to, to really help improve the quality of life of, of the people that I was supposed to be helping. Um, and so that led me to uh, a few roles, but one in particular with the Canadian Mental Health Association in Manitoba, uh, uh, first at a regional level uh, and then at, uh, at a national level. Um, but at a regional level, running a small branch focused on service delivery, uh, trying to make some positive improvements and, uh, in, in the way mental health care was delivered. And then from there, I think really took an interest in understanding work environments uh, and in particular how the work environment plays a role in our health and well-being. And, um, you know, a lot of my education was focused on the social determinants of health and very, uh, very familiar with taking that contextual environmental approach. And when I started learning more about how the work environment influences the mental health of people within it, uh, I think it really just sparked a lot more interest uh, on my end. So uh, f- uh, most recently, prior to uh, my consulting practice, I worked for the Canadian Mental Health Association as their National Director of Workplace Mental Health uh, and was responsible for overseeing and, and guiding a whole host of programs uh, across Canada that were meant to make a positive impact. And, um, and so I suppose that's the playing that led me uh, to the work that I do now. Which, which is focused on, uh, on working with clients that want to make that positive impact and helping them develop uh, more robust approaches to a mental health strategy within their organization. So uh, I guess, does that answer your question? It does. So now tell me a little bit about how you help organizations, because one of the benefits for you is they reach out to you because they want to make a positive difference. How do you help them to do that? Well, I find in so many cases, it's, it's uh, companies reach out, reach out to me that have the best of intentions and in many ways are, are interested in psychological health and safety because, quite frankly, they already care about their people. Uh, and, and they're looking for a little more guidance and in some cases, just simply how to get started. Uh, and those are in some of my favorite clients to work with, uh, clients that uh, are interested in in providing a healthy workplace for their employees uh, and companies that are already trying to take what I would say is a human first approach to work and just need a structure, need a framework to, to help them figure out more concretely how to do that. And so often what I work 
with companies on is number one, identifying some of the core purpose in why they want to improve psychological health and safety. And I think identifying that why is really critical. If, if companies try to take action and don't really understand the motive or, or, or articulate the motive behind it, it becomes very difficult to sustain that type of change. Also kind of difficult to get buy-in from employees too. So I, I help companies identify a bit more of the why and maybe even articulate the why. And then uh, in most cases, uh, it follows what I would say is a fairly traditional uh, consulting process. I, I help them take a look at where they're at right now, whether that's auditing their policies, their procedures, whether that's running some type of employee survey or crunching some numbers with them. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we get to a, a place of collaborative action planning, setting realistic goals and, and trying to figure out what's going to help them move the needle. And, and I think setting reasonable goals is, is really important. Sort of what's that one degree shift that we can make again and again and again that, that's eventually going to get us to the place where they, where they want to go. So uh, that, that, that's, uh, I think, in a nutshell, how I like to engage with my clients is thinking about this one degree at a time, because uh, in my experience, uh, I'd rather have slow, sustainable progress than uh, rapid, unpredictable, fluctuating progress. Well, and so many organizations are already at capacity. They're busy. Mm -hmm. They're struggling to deal with life as it is right now and helping uh, manage hybrid teams, helping to uh, get the work done in spite of the pandemic. And your idea of one degree at a time is probably much easier for them to manage than let's go and implement the entire national standard of Canada on psychological health and safety in the workplace. So exactly, that, exactly. And, <coughs> and you talk also about the employer versus employee focused strategies to address mental health. Can you share a bit about what that difference is when we focus on employees versus employer. Sure, absolutely I can. But actually, well, first I'm actually going to jump back to what you just said while well, I was busy hacking a lung uh, <laughs> is, as, as just around what sustainable change can, can be for a company. And, and so I, I talked to a lot of companies about the national standard for psychological health and safety. Uh, it's, it's very rare though, that I have a client that comes to me that says we want to adopt this standard or we want to implement this standard. And, and that's actually okay. What I, my best advice to companies is uh, we know that the standard exists. We know it provides a really comprehensive framework for addressing psychological health and safety, uh, but it's often very overwhelming. So, so if we're looking for that one degree or progressive shift that's sustainable change, I just simply say, well, let's start with a continuous improvement approach to mental health. Right. If, if, if we can start there uh, and make that the focus, uh, you go through that plan, do check act cycle enough times, you're going to look back in five years and you're going to look at the standard and say, oh, hey, actually, we're already doing a good chunk of this. So I try to make that the focus on the front end. And, and the other piece, too, we talked about businesses. You mentioned businesses being overloaded, managing hybrid teams and change. And, and I had a really, really fascinating conversation with uh, a, a client of mine in the manufacturing industry. And they, they asked me a question, which is to say, well, can we actually impact the mental health of our employees? And, uh, and, and which, which is something they'd sort of been wrestling with. And, and so we had a discussion about how and why and yes, and all of the facts and figures. And, and, and then we started talking about what actually works, what actually helps do that. And it was like this light bulb went off in the room and, and one of the executives essentially just said, oh, so it's basically just about doing business better. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that, that's basically what it is, right? Like this is not, it's not something we're adding to your plate. It's actually about taking a look at what you're already doing and, and the business processes, practices that you already have and trying to do those one degree better, you know? And so it doesn't have to be this overwhelming thing, but but back to your question around employer versus employee focused uh, strategies and approaches. And this is, again, another common conversation I have with employers. And I like to use the analogy of a hard hat. And for those of you that are in uh, the health and safety profession, you know what a hard hat is, right? It's personal protective equipment. If we think about that hierarchy of controls, it's right down at the bottom of that hierarchy, right? If you can't do anything else, give somebody a hard hat. That way, in case something happens, in case something falls apart, in case a brick falls from the sky, uh, there's a chance that they, they won't get injured, right? And 
And, uh, and, you know, we teach em employees and workers the importance of the hard hat. We tell them how to wear it. We tell them when to wear it. Uh, and we, we encourage them to do so and all of that kind of stuff. And, and so I often think of employee focused strategies in the workplace very much as hard hats. So let's take, for example, uh, resilience training. Who knows? I mean, I mean, and I and 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 Marianne, I know you, and I know I have. We've we've provided education to employees on resilience, and and it's absolutely an important and helpful thing to do. But that's kind of like giving them a hard hat, right? So uh, at the end of the day, <clears throat> there are hazards in the workplace, and. And we're trying to help employees protect themselves. But uh, the, the analogy I would often then give is to say, but, but at the same time, if you're an employer and some employers, some managers, some leaders, they're standing up three floors uh, above an employee who's wearing a hard hat and they're throwing bricks at their head. And, and it doesn't matter how great that hard hat is. And it doesn't matter how many hard hats you give somebody, eventually they're gonna get hurt. And so employer focused strategies, in my mind, examine who and how and when and why we're throwing bricks at people's heads and try to stop throwing the bricks. Uh, let's not avoid giving them a hard hat. But again, if we're going to keep hucking bricks from three stories up, uh, eventually someone's going to get hurt. So that's how I would explain the difference between employer and employee focused strategies when it comes to mental health in the workplace. Uh, that's great. That's a great analogy, um, Jordan. And I think about the bricks, right? The bricks are lack of clarity. The bricks are mm -hmm. unreasonable demands, micromanaging. Mm -hmm. They are um, uh, lack of cohesion, um, unclear mm -hmm. expectations. And yet employers don't mean to cause harm, but they're not always aware of how to mm. prevent it right? How to do yep. these things in a psychologically safer way. And so if you can help help them understand that, that's probably a very positive thing. Um, you also talk um, and you know, we're opening up the national standard, right? It's going to be 10 mm -hmm. years old next year, and we're looking at it. And one of the things that we're going to focus on is making it even more practical Mm -hmm. for small businesses um, to use it and to be able to leverage it to help them. And that's one of the things that you focus on is really how do you help small organizations with mm -hmm. very practical things that they don't have to be a mental health expert, they don't have to be an HR expert, mm -hmm. but they can start. What would you advise them? That's exactly it. And and there's a bunch of places that, that a small business can get started. And uh, and the number one thing I, I, I talk about is really, and in many ways, the number one thing I help support small businesses do to do is, is make mental health a conversation in the workplace. I think you, you really have to start there. Uh, and that's something that often starts with leadership. Um, and so it's about normalizing that conversation. Uh, so whether it's through team check-ins, asking people how they're feeling, finding some way to check in with your team in a way that's a little bit more meaningful than, hey, how's your day going? Fine. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, that's number one. I often also encourage leaders uh, and, and provide them with some advice around how to talk about their mental health in the context of the workplace, because it's something that uh, managers and leaders uh, frequently struggle with is how do I, how do I talk about when I'm struggling uh, with my team in a way that doesn't burden them, uh, but uh, in a way that, that is authentic and vulnerable, uh, but also then in a way that's helpful. And so what I, what I talk to leaders in about is, is this idea of, of, uh, sharing what is a, a, a narrative or some sort of a story arc with, in terms of your mental health or your stress. And so, you know, we want to understand the challenge and we want to, we want to understand your, you know, what, what you're feeling and how you're feeling and how it's impacting you. But then the most helpful part of that narrative is actually understanding what you're doing or what you've done to start feeling better and looking after yourself. Uh, and so that understanding the challenge, that's what helps people relate. That's what helps people connect. That's what establishes some universality of, of that experience. And then from there, once you've connected, uh, it's most helpful if you start talking about what are the positive things you're doing to manage your stress, to improve your mood, to look after your mental health, to maintain your resilience. And so that's, 
that's one great place to get started. If you're a small organization, if you're a leader in a small business, is to normalize that conversation. And in many, in, in many instances, it can start with, with you and, and with your own story. Yeah, I remember, and this would have been over 20 years ago now, geez. Um, and I was at one of the top five banks and talking yeah. about mental health and mental illness. And at that time, it just really wasn't a conversation for a boardroom table of a, mm-hmm. a bank. And the vice president decided to share their experience of mental illness. Every mouth around that table was hanging open. They were shocked because here was a competent professional talking about their experience with clinical depression. Mm-hmm. And what happened then is you start to hear other people around the table saying, oh my goodness, I had that experience too. We've come really far in terms of people being able to share um, the story of what they're experiencing. But I love the way you talk about the story arc. And it's um, what I believe too, that it's not enough to say, here's how I'm suffering although that is important, it's saying, Mm -hmm. and here's what I'm doing about it. That's the leadership. And I'm talking about leadership at every level, whether you're a frontline employee who's deciding to share um, or you're the CEO deciding to share is what is it that you've learned about your situation that you can share? Uh, Yeah, go ahead. That's exactly it. And, And that's what we know, of course, is that that's really one of the few evidence-based ways to reduce stigma to open up conversations more broadly about mental health and well-being is sharing that lived experience, sharing those stories. And, and, and unless you can open up those conversations, it makes it very difficult for uh, an employer, for anyone within a workplace to become an effective support, to become an effective connector to the types of resources that employees who are struggling are, are, are going to find helpful. Yeah, that's great. Now, you also talk about um, management or leadership strategies that support psychological health. Can you tell us a little bit about what those are and, uh, and how you advise people to go about it? Yeah, well, the first one is quite simple. The first one is really about building your own self-awareness as a leader. And it's, it's, I think, first about understanding your own responses, reactions to the stressors and challenges and difficulties you're facing day to day. Uh, you know, those, those stressors, if we don't think about them, we don't think about our own reactions I and mean, they can cause us to behave in all sorts of ways uh, that have direct impacts on, on the employees that we're dealing with, right? So the first step for any leader, if, if, if I'm trying to, trying to educate them or trying to coach them around how to create a psychologically safe work environment is to understand yourself, understand what triggers your stress responses and understand what your automatic responses to stress and adversity are. Um, and, and then we start to think about, well, what might be, what might the impacts be on other people? Uh, but if you don't take the time to look at yourself first, it's, it's very difficult to understand how you can change your behavior in a way that's uh, productive and, and helpful for, for other employees. So awareness is, is always uh, number one. Uh, the second uh, domain that I often talk about is communication. Uh, how are you communicating with your employees? And it's not just about how often are you communicating with your employees. It's often about the, the tone with which you're communicating to your employees, the messages that you're sending either explicitly or implicitly in how you communicate with your employees uh, that often convey a lot of hidden meaning. And uh, as a leader, perhaps we don't, off- we don't think about it, but the, the number of times, even myself as a leader, I've communicated messages to my team and I've had them completely misinterpreted or people ask me, hey, are, are you really okay? Or, hey, did I do something wrong? Because they completely misread or perhaps I just didn't communicate clearly enough. And, and maybe I'll, I'll say that. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the ownership on that one it's because I didn't communicate clearly enough. Um, and so 
understanding the impact of the words we use is really important. One, one analogy that I've come to really quite appreciate uh, over the course of the pandemic is called the, uh, the, the, uh, the Stockdale paradox. Uh, and it's this idea of how you communicate as a leader in the context of uh, uncertainty and, and adversity. And it comes from uh, a military man, Admiral James Stockdale, who was imprisoned in Vietnam. And, uh, and many, many prisoners of war in Vietnam uh, did not survive that experience. But of course, some did. And, and Admiral Stockdale was one of them. And and uh, journalists after the fact and, uh, and, and even experts in resilience have, have, have asked him, well, how, how did you do that? What's the, what's the mindset you needed to take and how did you need to convey that to others? And, and it's become referred to now as bounded optimism, which is, of course, a recognition of the difficulty and the challenge that everybody is facing um, with, paired with uh, an, an unwavering uh, understanding and hope that eventually you will get through it. Uh, so that seemed to be the secret sauce. And so I've been talking with leaders a lot throughout the course of the pandemic, but communicating in that frame of, of bounded optimism. So it's, communication it's being a, the second one. Yeah, it's a, it's a balance, right? Because mm -hmm. bounded optimism, toxic positivity, lack of reality, um, or just straight out negativity. Mm -hmm. And you think, okay, how do we balance all of that so that we're optimistic, but we're not fooling ourselves? because that yeah. lack of being genuine is uh, damaging to our mental health if we just want to look on the bright side. But I love that term bounded, like there's boundaries around our optimism. But uh, my feeling is you got to hope that things are going to get better and you got to work towards it no matter what's going on. Um, Absolutely, but, yes. Yeah, without burying your head in the sand. About <laughs> That's what's exactly actually it. going on. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. A leader with their head buried in the sand isn't, isn't able to make very well-informed or well-intentioned decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you think that um, people with mental health issues, so diagnosis of depression, anxiety, something like that, are faring in, in these times through the pandemic? question and, and I'll admit I, I'm a little bit rusty on my data but what I understand and I think what I intuitively know from from myself as somebody with a diagnosed mental health condition is is the front end of this pandemic was uh, difficult lots of change really rapid change uh, a, a lot of what was impacted were the supports that we build around ourselves so uh, I have uh, a colleague that refers to this as your circle of care. And, uh, and so for, for individuals with mental health conditions, their circle of care in many ways was limited when the pandemic started, right? That network of support that we all learn to rely on, that's a foundation of our resilience, uh, was in so many ways limited and, and restricted. Uh, and so that was difficult at the front end. I think from a workplace person. Yeah, sorry, Gordon, just before you go forward, can you give us an example of a, a common circle of care? Who's in it? Well, I, I would say your circle of care uh, can consist of a bunch of different components, but it's, it's, it's the group of people that you rely on when times are tough. And, and we all have a circle of care and not just individuals with a mental health condition, right? Uh, each of us has that circle, uh, call it social support, call it your support network, whatever works for you. Um, you know, so for me, for instance, my circle of care looks like my doctor, it looks like my spouse, uh, my brother is in there. I have a couple of good friends that are in there as well. And it's also important to note that each of us, each person in that circle of care serves a different purpose. Right? So I depend on my spouse for things like encouragement and emotional support and helping me think through and problem solve difficult issues that I'm trying to uncover and, and, and you know, figure out in my life. Uh, I don't generally rely on my mom for those things. Uh, but if I need, if I need, uh, if I need great home cooked pierogies, uh, and some comfort food, man, uh, that's exactly where I'm going. Right. Or, or my brother, for instance, right. Uh, I probably wouldn't rely on him for, for, uh, for, for emotional support, but if my car doesn't start and I need to boost and that's really stressing me out because I need to get to work, uh, yeah, I'll call him and I know he'll be there. Right. So, so that, that circle of care is so important for each and every one of us, not just individual mental illness. And, and, and the pandemic in so many ways at the front end has restricted that circle of care. 
uh, and made it harder to access the circle of care. I think now we found creative ways to maintain access to that circle of care, but that was, I think, for, for individuals with mental health conditions, a real challenge. Now, from a workplace perspective, as we've carried through the pandemic, I actually think, and, and I think there's some data to suggest that individuals with mental health conditions are faring, uh, are faring better, not necessarily better than average, but better in, in many ways because the type of support in the workplace that individuals with mental health conditions most commonly identify as helpful is flexibility, which has now become almost baked into the way everybody works. And so I think that's, uh, if we're talking silver linings and nobody likes to find a silver lining in a global pandemic, but perhaps that's one of them in, in that the, the support that was most needed is now uh, built into our, into our work and, and really afforded to everybody. So uh, I, I think it's changed a little bit and that's my take on it. Yeah. Now, you and I have both agreed that we're very appreciative of and sick and tired of screen time. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, it's, it's great that we had this <laughs> rather than just the telephone, but uh, enough is enough. Um, what is your advice to people who are feeling that burnout, that fatigue? That's a great question. Uh, and, and I'll admit that I struggle with that because I'm not sure I've gotten entirely figured out myself. And so, so any advice I'm giving will come very much from uh, a lived experience perspective. And, um, and so for me, what's certainly been helpful is, uh, and it's fairly obvious, but getting away from the screen uh, and finding ways to disconnect, or I would say perhaps differently connect. Um, I never quite thought I would appreciate receiving a phone call as much as I do now. And, uh, and the relief that I get when I see a meeting in my calendar and I see a phone number to call instead of a Zoom link, uh, because it allows me to go sit on that glorious couch I have behind me, uh, uh, kick my feet up and and focus on one piece of sensory input at a time uh and and that in in a way uh has been a bit of a secret for me in terms of managing my own stress and maintaining my own energy is trying to in fact focus on one piece of input at a time uh and so you could call that mindfulness if you want i suppose uh, but, but different people would call it different things, I guess, but, um, but finding ways, I guess, to limit the amount of information that's bombarding my brain, I think has been really beneficial. So whether it's turning off the screen, whether it's, uh, some noise canceling headphones, whether it's going for a walk, uh, and feeling the cold Winnipeg winter air on my face, uh, whatever it is, you know, finding those sensory moments, uh, has, has been been certainly really helpful. I think as well, a couple other things, um, very intentional disconnection from work. And I know we say it, um, but it's, it's important to instill it. And, and if you're a leader, you know, we, uh, the, other, the other piece that's really important to talk about is, is role modeling this behavior. Uh, and so finding and prioritizing time to actually not be on actually not be working, actually not be available, and actually have people not expect a response from you, uh, I think is, is, of course, really important. Now, there's, a, there's a, a lot that we can talk about at the organizational level that enables people to do that. Um, but, but ultimately, that's, that's what has to happen to prevent burnout is, is literally is time away from work to refuel the, refuel the fire. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm with you. I, I know that what you're saying is true, but then there's times where I just say, oh, I'm just going to get all this done and you, you let it go. And Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, but, but for example, Marianne, I mean, you had a beautiful out of office reply when I emailed you today. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, 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 and it kind of triggered, uh, not triggered in a bad way, but even cued for me that, you know, it's okay to, to give yourself permission to, 
to not be re- not be responding to people, right? And and you know, for those of you that haven't emailed Marianne today, it said something <laughs> like, "I'm going to be unavailable all week from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. Please do not expect a response." And uh, and I thought, well, I mean, that's very blunt and very refreshing, uh, <laughs> much like I expected from Marianne Baden. <laughs> At least I'm consistent, Jordan. Very that's consistent. It. Yes, very yeah. consistent. Yeah. What What would you say has been the evolution since you started in this area? What have you seen that's changed for better or worse in the field of workplace mental health, psych health and safety? Oh, wow. Uh, such a broad sweeping question, Marianne. <laughs> <clears throat> I should have expected that one. But, but I would say uh, for, for better, and this is the obvious one, businesses care more about it than they did, uh, you know, even eight years ago when I was first exposed to the topic. Or two um, years ago before. Or even pandemic. two years ago for that matter. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're right. Uh, so people care about it more. I mean, it's, it's, it's at the boardroom table now, very much in counterpoint to, to you know, the discussion you were talking about 20 years ago. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think executives of, of large companies recognize now that this is important and they recognize that it's also important for themselves. Which, which may not have been the case uh, even a couple of years ago. So of course that's a positive change. Um, there is certainly an increase in uh, technology and technological solutions to support psychological health and safety and workplace mental health. Um, I see that in the long term as a positive. In the short term, what that does, it, it gives employers a whole bunch of different options that in many ways are very difficult for them to evaluate on their own. Uh, so that is certainly a challenge and, and the evidence around any specific, you know, program solution product uh, is, is quite limited. So it's a, it's a bit of the wild west when it comes to navigating effective solutions, because there's not a lot of data or information to really help us understand what solutions are effective. So, so that's, that's a bit of a, a, a try as you go kind of approach at the moment. Again, long-term, I think it'll be helpful. And then I think the other one that's, that I, I think is, goes, goes a bit of both directions is there are perhaps now more than ever, a lot more people like you and me that uh, that are delving into the field and and playing in the area of psychological health and safety, much much as 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 you said, using your own words, right? And uh, and again, pros and cons. I think what that says to me is that businesses uh, are hungry for solutions. They're looking for guidance. They're looking for advice. I think the challenge there is discerning uh, is discerning who, who should be giving that advice. Um, uh, so that, that I think is a bit of a challenge as well. And, and, and in many ways, not surprising, I mean, mental health, you talk about any aspect of mental health, whether it be clinical care or workplace mental health, uh, has really sort of been, uh, the wild, wild west, right. It's nobody's territory, so to speak. And so it becomes everybody's territory. And so I think that's a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Some of our colleagues are, um, really shook up about the fact that anybody can say I'm doing psychological health and safety and yeah. that they don't have credentials, but it's like any new field, right? Mm-hmm. We, we do, you call it the wild, wild west, but uh, my opinion is that I'm really glad there's so many mm-hmm. people who are picking this up and running with it and whether there'll be more structure, more regulation mm-hmm. later, isn't the issue to me as much as people are, understanding the business imperative as well as the value to employees and i think that's a real positive of course and i think the only thing i would say and and you know i have the benefit i suppose of being a regulated health professional right so if i do something wrong people know exactly who they can call to file a complaint um but but to anyone that that is interested in this field and and wants to get into this field my, uh, you have my absolute encouragement. Uh, please do, and it's an area of need certainly uh, across the business community. And and there's there's no there's no there's no shortage of of, of need and no shortage of desire. Uh, I think certainly you know we each need to have and hold high uh, in high regard a responsibility to to stay well educated, well informed. Uh, and and I think reflect on what the ethical principles are uh, under which we each operate, right? In, in in particular around doing no harm, because I think the other the other 
challenge is that any change within a business and and that's really what psychological health and safety comes down to at the core of it is changing the way we're doing business and you know, recognizing that uh, with every change, there can be unintended consequences. And so that'd be my one encouragement is, is to keep that top of mind and, and really for each of us to critically reflect on what's the potential, what's the potential downside of, of perhaps what we're encouraging an employer to do or what we're doing with an employer and, and finding ways to mitigate that risk as well. Right. That we're not doing flavor of the month. And my yeah. advice to employers is decide what you want to be different, decide mm-hmm. how you would measure success, and then ask your potential consultant how they would do that. And yep. then you've got a, a real clarity rather than what should I do and how should I do it and just take their word for it, that you really think it through. Now, um, part of what you offer in your service is really helping them to uncover that. But even, even, you know, engaging in that and then saying, okay, Jordan, you know, how are you going to get us there? What are you going to do? And making sure it fits. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I think for businesses too, to understand that, you know, when you're working with someone who is, is helping you address psychological health and safety, you know, understand that, that there's two X, there's two, two different types of expertise in the room right? There's, there's one that is, that comes from this body of knowledge and understanding of what this topic is and what effective interventions and approaches look like. The other is your understanding of your business and what you want to achieve. And, and don't, don't check that at the door. It's such an important part of the process. It's such an important part of understanding what success looks like and measuring that success and making sure that as we make these changes in businesses towards psychological health and safety, that, uh, that we're doing those in, in a way that, that are, are going to be, in fact, harm, uh, not harmful and, and beneficial. And I know myself sometimes as a small business owner, I don't want to have to do my part, which is explaining the business and, you know, saying mm-hmm. this is what I want. I just want somebody to fix it and, you yep. know, just come in and do it. And it never works. It never works. Never. So unless I'm going to take responsibility, unless I'm going to partner with the person that's going to make the change, it's not going to happen properly. And um, great that you as a consultant can put that up front and say, this is what's necessary. Well, absolutely. And it is even a conversation I've had recently with, with uh, a client that that's, that's interested in doing some really great work is, and they've asked me, well, Jordan, where do you see us going? And, and what, what do we need to do? And, and I just said, whoa, 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 hold the horse. You know, like we, that's a conversation that both of us need to have. And, and I can't answer that until, until I understand uh, your perspective as well. Yeah, that's right. I hear Charlotte <laughs> in the background. Yes. So, um, so let's go there. You being uh, a new parent and um, trying to balance everything in life. Uh, you've talked a little bit about resilience, but the idea of focusing on one thing when you have, you know, a spouse, a child, a home to take care of, a business, um, as well as clients that are depending on you, what, what are the tips that you'd give to people who feel like they're hanging on by a thread right now? Oh, what a great question. You're so full of them today, Marianne. Uh, <laughs> Did you just say I was full of it? <laughs> no, it's full of them, full of really great questions. Oh, good. Okay. Really great okay. questions. Just, yes. just clarifying. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, hmm. uh, well, I think uh, a couple things that, that I might say, uh, and you're getting a bit of raw, unfiltered Jordan, I suppose, is, is, um, is number one, you know, you're going to be more effective at everything if you choose not to divide your attention between everything. Um, So that's one piece of advice, perhaps. And we know that to be true. It's such a difficult reality to to wrap your head around. And and I struggle with it all the time. Um, And I, I think the other thing that I would suggest and reinforce and something I continually reinforce for myself is this fundamental truth that uh, I have and you have and everyone listening has made it through every difficult thing that we have ever encountered in our life. And perhaps if we take a moment and rest with that thought 
that can add a little bit of hope and clarity um, is that no matter how stretched you might be feeling, uh, you can get through this because you have gotten through everything you've ever had to get through in your life so far. Isn't it funny how we dismiss, negate, minimize all the other times that we mm -hmm. were able to deal with challenges, deal with disappointments, deal with frustrations and get beyond it because we think this time's different. This time. This, this time's got to be different. There's never, yeah. there's never been anything so challenging ever in my life. Uh, <laughs> it is interesting. And that's that negativity bias that we're all hardwired with. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so even something as simple as making a list of the difficult times that you've gotten through and one or two ideas of what helped you get through it. Um, I think that's a, that's a really important practice when you're faced with a difficult situation, when you feel like what you've got in front of you is overwhelming and, and impossible is to, to remember that you've, you've probably done overwhelming and impossible before, and you've probably done it pretty well. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's just to have that awareness, at, which is how you started this, right? About leaders mm -hmm. having self-awareness that if we don't do that first, the rest of the work is really difficult to it. I personally feel like I've been through a decade of therapy because we have to learn these things, teach these things, and it, it can't help but say, hey, wait a minute, I'm not actually doing what I'm telling people to do. <laughs> Maybe I could do a better job of it. Yeah. 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 Completely agree. Yeah. So I've got one last question for you, but before I get to it, is there anything else that you want the listeners to know? Any other tips or strategies that you have? Oh boy, uh, what's in what's in Jordan's toolbox? Is that a is that a what's in mm. your toolbox question? Sure. Well, I, I think other other tips, strategies, and and I'll, I'll maybe particularly talk uh, talk to leaders uh, is is number one uh, you, you need to be you need to be walking the walk and talking the talk. Um, I think that's really important. And it, I think it's something that's, that's fairly evident and been made quite evident throughout the course of the pandemic. Uh, you know, leaders are not immune to the challenges of a, a difficult work environment, immune to the challenges that they face with workload or stress or anything like that. And, and so, um, you know, make sure that as a leader, you're, you're doing the things that you are encouraging your teams and your staff to do to look after their well-being. So, so walk, walk the walk and, and, and if you're going to talk the talk uh, and, uh, and then the other thing I would say to leaders, and this one is admittedly a bit of a struggle and even a struggle for me. And I'm thinking back to a time when I was uh, uh, a leader in, in, in a, in a formal sense is, uh, is try to remember as well that the people that you're supporting probably also care about you. And, and that can be a difficult thing. Uh, and we, as leaders, we can get so wrapped up in our desire to care about and support others around us that we forget that they want to do the same for us. So I like to go back to that circle of care analogy I used earlier is that um, you have people in your circle of care and chances are good for everybody that's in your circle of care you are also in theirs. Uh, and so there's some reciprocity to these relationships. And the same is true for a manager or a leader. So uh, don't forget that the team that you're trying to support also wants to support you uh, and be open to that as well. Um, it's, such a it's such a challenging thing and it requires a bit of a shift in, in how we think of ourselves as a leader, but be open to the care and kindness that your team is willing to give you. That was a hard, hard lesson for me to learn. Jordan, and I really struggled with it because I was someone who took care of. I was uh, someone who nurtured. I was not someone who ever burdened somebody until um, I realized what a gift it feels to me when somebody trusts me, when somebody mm -hmm. comes to me and wants help and that I feel valued when that happens and why the question to me was, why are you withholding that opportunity mm -hmm. for the people who you know care about you? That's uh, exactly it. And, yeah. and I, I kind of draw back to some of the research that's been done around kindness and this idea that kindness is not just good for the person receiving it, but also good for the person 
giving or expressing it. And so that's the way I like to talk about it with leaders is, is, is kindness is good on both sides of the table. And so if, if you choose not to accept the care and, and kindness that, that a, a team member, an employee, a colleague is, is, is willing to give you, you're actually robbing them of some of the benefits of, of doing or saying that kind thing. So be open to that kindness. Great. I mean, the thing that um, I've always admired about you, Jordan, is the balance between um, authenticity or or maybe even vulnerability and the wisdom um, that you share with people openly, uh, that you just give it away. Um, Yeah, sure, you're charged as a consultant, but that you are very um, open and very able to help people along in a compassionate and caring in an authentic way. And I, I really appreciate that about you. Um, so here's your last question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Is that if somebody said to you, well, what the heck is psych health and safety? Of course, you know, the definition that Martin Shane mm-hmm. and the technical committee came up with, yep. but not using that, just using common language that anybody would understand. How would you describe psych health and safety? Well, in my mind, there's, there's two bullet points that, that come up. Um, the first one is psychological health and safety is, is about finding ways for a business to look after their most valuable assets, uh, which are their people and in our brain-based economy, the minds of their employees. So, so protecting, protecting the minds of your employees as your most valuable asset. The second way I would define psychological health and safety is creating a work environment that in the chaos of everyday life can serve as a haven. So in, in my ideal world, a psychologically safe work environment is a place where employees go and they feel supported, they feel cared for, they feel that they belong when so many other things in the world could be telling them otherwise or could be creating chaos or stress in their life. It's, it's that safe haven that, that they can go to for eight to 16 hours a day. <laughs> okay. Not the 16 hours. A day, no, please. No, please. No. I think the thing that many employers don't understand is that when work is my safe haven, that's when I can do my best work and uh, that it's not about the touchy feely. Let's, you know, make everybody feel good. Um, but when I feel good, I work well. And that's, that's that. Yeah. I feel Jordan, good, I work well. <laughs> There's some, wisdom. Oh, is that a new tagline? <laughs> I think it might be actually. Nice okay. work. You, you can steal it. Yeah. <laughs> you can steal it. Um, Jordan, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to take a couple clips from this. It'll be on LinkedIn with Flourish DX, who, um, Uh, actually sponsors this podcast or on my LinkedIn. And uh, I know that people that are interested in talking more to you can find you there as well. Yeah, great. Well, thanks again for having me, Marianne. It's always a pleasure getting to chat and, uh, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing, seeing how, how this resonates with our audience. That's great. Thanks, Jordan.